If you type Reunion Island into Google, you'd be met with stunning images of volcanoes covered in greenery, mountain waterfalls, hiking trails and white sand beaches backdropped with turquoise blue crystal clear waters teeming with life. And you'd be forgiven for thinking this little speck of land in the middle of the Indian Ocean was pure paradise, something out of a tropical holiday brochure, and I wouldn't blame you for wanting to book your flight out there straight away. But others out there will know of a different story, one that clouded over this island for over a decade one of pain, suffering, and death. A story of beach closures, permanent bans on swimming and surfing, and a resident population who were growing increasingly agitated with their government representatives, leading to occasionally violent protests. A story about an island that for at one point in time was statistically one of the most likely places in the world you'd be bitten by a shark. And if you were, your chances of surviving that bite were almost 50-50. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. Today, we're gonna to be taking a closer look at Reunion Island and the shark attacks that have happened there over the last 15 years or so. And by the end of this video, you'll have heard from a researching shark scientist why this tiny little island had so many shark attacks. And I'll let you know whether it's safe to go back in the water. It's a video lots and lots of you here on Shark Bites have asked for before, and there's no doubt it's gonna be a mega interesting one. As a shark scientist, I've been aware of Reunion Island for probably the last six years. I know of and have read research papers about the sharks that live there and the major human wildlife conflict that bubbled away on the island for the best part of a decade. It truly is an amazing case study that we can look at from a scientific perspective to learn more about shark attacks and why they might happen. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Reunion and its history of shark attacks. We'll look into the stories of some of the lives that were lost and importantly the factors that led to it being one of the most dangerous places in the world to go in the sea. This is a pretty emotive topic though and I have to say straight off the bat that I'm going to be coming at this from a scientific perspective. But we should also remember here that many lives have been lost or at least dramatically changed because of sharks. Human wildlife conflict is a very real issue and it occurs daily around the world with loads of different animals. And because of it, it creates supercharged emotions from those who are directly impacted by that conflict. As a scientist and a scientific communicator, my job here is to step back and take a look at this whole issue from a broader perspective. And hopefully I can shine a light on some of these issues for you and remind you all that case studies like this aren't black and white. Before we delve into some of the sharky stuff though, we've got to take a look at the island itself. Reunion is a relatively small volcanic island situated in the Western Indian Ocean, about 420 miles off the coast of Madagascar. If you hadn't heard of it before, it's not too far from Mauritius, which is a pretty popular tourist destination. It's a French colony island, which means it's owned and governed by France. Back in the 1600s, Reunion was uninhabited until every man and their dog started exploring and the French just managed to get there first. Like most colonial islands, it does have a pretty dark history involving slavery, but when slavery was abolished by the colony in 1848, the island became mostly inhabited by French immigrants, or those descended from former African, Chinese, and Indian slaves, who as of today, inhabit the island with a population of over 800,000 people. The island itself is about 970 square miles and looks like how you might imagine any volcanic island looks. Steep volcanic ridges in the middle with most of its towns and cities around the edges. There's a very distinct split though in population density for the island, with the majority of its inhabitants inhabitants living in the western and northern sections. This bit's a pretty important one, so remember that for later. Reunion basically had no culture of water sports activities until French mainlanders exposed them to surfing during the surf craze in the 1960s. And for most of the 1900s, I would say that Reunion experienced its fair share of shark incidents. But nothing out of the ordinary for a tropical island inhabited by lots and lots of different predatory shark species. And for an island where you've got loads of people in the water with surfboards and bodyboards trying to catch a wave. Although from 2011, all of this changed. For nearly a decade between 2011 and 2019, Reunion experienced a massive unexplained spike in their shark related incidents. In those eight years, they had 24 shark attacks, 11 of which were fatal. That's just shy of a 50% fatality rate, which is crazy when you look at it statistically because the rest of the world has an average fatality rate of 11%. Surfers, scientists, government officials, and the local populace were all arguing with each other as to what they were gonna do. And Reunion was plunged into what is now known as the shark crisis. So let's rewind back to 2011. Reunion had already experienced its first shark attack that year in the form of Eddie Aubert, a 31 year old who was killed in June by an unknown shark species while out bodyboarding. But it was the second fatal attack that happened that year that sparked a real outcry from the locals. Matteo Schiller, a 32 year old former bodyboarding champion headed out into the waves at 3.30 p.m. off Bucancano, 
a popular surf spot on Reunion Island with six other surfers. A red flag was present that day on the beaches, indicating that the waves were perhaps a little too dangerous for swimmers, but for surfers and bodyboarders alike, these were the type of waves that they relished. Because of the size of the waves that day, Schiller headed a little bit further out than normal to navigate the surf lineup approximately 20 meters from the shore. According to eyewitnesses that were there, Schiller's body burst out of the sea. The shark beneath him had stood him up and his legs were in its mouth. As he beat at the shark with his bodyboard, a second shark leapt out of the water and bit into Schiller's torso. And the momentum of that second shark carried him down below the waves. The other surfers in the water managed to get Schiller's body back on his board, but as they were doing so, a wave swept it off and it was lost. Rescuers searched the area with boats, jet skis, and a helicopter, but his body was never recovered. The shark species responsible for this attack remains unknown, but based on other attacks around the island, fingers were firmly pointed at two species, bull sharks or tiger sharks. Schiller was a popular man in the reunion community. Having worked as a lifeguard, he'd set up a surf school teaching youngsters from all around the island. Thousands of people turned out for his memorial, releasing flowers into the sea to commemorate him, but the tide had now began to turn. People wanted answers, and action. Two years into the shark crisis, after a total of four fatal attacks and other non-fatal incidents, the Reunion Island government had decided to place a ban on all swimming and surfing across the entire island, save for a few different areas. They even had warning messages played on in-flight announcements for those arriving to Reunion Island. Have a listen to this. The users of the sea have to remain watchful in front of risk sharks. The bathing and the practice of certain nautical activities can be made in the lagoon and in the watched and fitted out zones. Can you imagine hearing that when you're just about to arrive to your holiday destination? The bans implemented by the government were controversial and considered by many locals to just be painting over the cracks and trying to prevent bad publicity across the world instead of actually finding solutions to solve the problem. And in reality, the bans didn't work. Surfers and swimmers defied government orders and continued to get in the water because the lure of the sea was just too much for them. But because of this, the surfers and swimmers continued to be attacked by the sharks, and there were more fatalities, one of whom was 13-year-old Elio Canestri, a junior surf champion and resident of Reunion. The accounts for this slightly differ on the record. Some say Elio was out with six or seven of his friends surfing, but his dad says that he was alone and spotted adults surfing in the water, so probably presumed it was safe. It was in an area where surfing had been banned due to the risk of sharks, although those in the water that day had ignored the ban and headed in regardless. Witnesses report Elio was propelled off his board by a shark from below and was flung around in the water as it bit into his abdomen. It then bit off his right arm and right leg and dragged him out to sea. Some sources say that a boat was quickly launched which managed to retrieve his body, but he had already died from his wounds. A few hours after the incident, two tiger sharks were caught in the vicinity, but it was unconfirmed as to whether a tiger shark was actually responsible for this attack. Again, the outcry from the community was massive and more pressure was put on the authorities to do something about it. Over the space of four years after the Elio Canestri incident, the reunion authorities experimented with multiple strategies to try and reduce shark attacks. These included rigid shark nets protecting some of the beaches and popular surf spots, including Buchan Cano, the site of the Matteo Schiller incident. The shark nets did their job until 2019, when a 21-year-old lost an arm and a leg in a shark attack off Bukan Kano. The shark net on the beach was revealed to have a two-meter hole of which the shark just swam straight through. Other methods used by the French government included culling sharks via smart drum lines, which is something that has been used by officials in South Africa and Australia in response to human shark conflict. Smart drum lines are basically baited hooks that are attached to a buoy with a GPS sensor on it that, when triggered, notifies officials via text. The officials then send out local fish who assess the drum line and examine what they've caught. The reunion government at this point had begun allowing the culling of certain shark species under strict regulation. Tiger sharks and bull sharks were permitted to be killed by fishermen provided that they were over 10 feet in length and the smaller ones were to be released without harm. This again caused fractions in the community with some locals agreeing that it was the right step to take and other animal activists vehemently disagreeing with it. Some had suggested as well that it wasn't a good idea to be placing baited hooks on drum lines that were close to popular beaches, especially in areas where they'd already had problems with the sharks before. Although a paper that I did read that was released back in 2020, I think, did show that the smart drum lines didn't attract bull sharks closer to shore, but nor did they act as a barrier to stop bull sharks coming closer to shore either, so they didn't really do much. Another incredibly inventive strategy used by the reunion authorities, which I've never seen before, by the way, was in-water shark spotters. Known locally as the Vigie, 
These are free divers equipped with spear guns who patrol the waters in popular surfing locations on the lookout for any sharks. Paired with the Vigie are boats on the surface with cameras deployed below, live streaming the footage back to those on shore. Supposedly, if a shark is spotted by either the Vigie or the boat patrols, a signal is sent to the lifeguards that are on the beach and all of the water users are ordered out of the water. It's a pretty inventive strategy, but costly and also requires a lot of man hours to perform it properly. So the reunion government was literally throwing everything at it, whether those strategies were right or wrong. And although I'm not gonna judge them from behind my desk because I wasn't there, it does look like they were pretty desperate. But one of the big questions that remains here is what was causing all of these shark attacks? Well, like we always do here on Shark Bites, we've got to look at multiple different factors. And it's probably a combination of these factors that leads to incidents like this taking place. Luckily for all you at home, I'm going to break them down for you one by one. The first is the geographical location of Reunion Island. Reunion sits in a pretty unique geographical position in the Indian Ocean, in an area that's been dubbed by many shark scientists as a shark highway. This is a part of the Indian Ocean that is used by many large predatory shark species who are moving in between South Africa and Australia or from Australia back to South Africa. It's also an incredibly biodiverse area with multiple different shark species calling this part of the world home. You've got what I like to call the big four. Great white sharks, tiger sharks, bull sharks, and oceanic white tips, which are the species more often than not that are responsible for biting humans and causing fatalities. Although some of you might ask why Mauritius, a neighboring island to Reunion, doesn't have as many shark attacks. Because Mauritius would also surely sit on this shark highway despite being 100 miles further north. Well, that brings us pretty nicely onto our second factor, which is topography, both above and below the water. I've spoken to you all before about the importance of topography when looking at shark attacks, especially that one in the Red Sea with Vladimir Popov. Click that link there, by the way, if you want to give it a watch. But it really is an important factor when you look at case studies like this. Reunion is a steep volcanic island, which means the seabed goes from really deep to really shallow very quickly. And this means that large predatory sharks can find themselves from the deep blue of the Indian Ocean to the shallow waters of Reunion pretty quickly. Mauritius is similar to Reunion in that it's a volcanic island, but differs in that geologically, it's much older than Reunion. To be precise, it's six million years older. And this means that Mauritius has had more time to rise out of the water over those millions and millions of years and doesn't jut out of the ocean as steeply as Reunion does, which is a key factor in enabling those large sharks to congregate in high numbers. It's been said before that Mauritius is largely surrounded by coral reefs, which can act as a barrier and reduce the numbers of sharks. Although I'm not really sure I'm buying that one because Reunion Island also has coral reefs. Admittedly, not as many as Mauritius, but they still have some. I don't really think a coral reef ring around the island is gonna stop all the sharks coming in, nor is it gonna stop them from biting people. I think it's much more likely to do with the geology and the steepness of the different islands, as opposed to coral reefs. Our next factor to add to this list though, again revolves around Reunion Island's volcanoes. There's two of them found on Reunion. The first, Piton de Neige, is an extinct volcano, but the second, Piton de la Fornace, is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, which over the last 10 years has erupted pretty much every nine months. Volcanic sediment is then washed down the steep slopes of Reunion into the surrounding water, creating murky water conditions. And noting here again, Mauritius only has extinct volcanoes, the last of which erupted nearly 30,000 years ago. So if you pair that sediment runoff with the pretty impressive surf break at Reunion Island, then you've got yourself some pretty turbid water of which is greatly favored by bull sharks. These shark species love to frequent and hunt in waters that are cloudy or murky. So you've got a bunch of different geographical and topography factors there that are all combining to not only bring the sharks in, but create conditions that they favor for hunting and feeding. Now we can add in the human factor. Remember way back at the start of this episode when I told you about the population density of the island. The majority of people who live on Reunion congregate towards the western section of the island. I think it's about 70% percent of the total population live in that area. And it just so happens that this is where the majority of the shark attacks take place. 80% of Reunion Island shark attacks since 1980 have taken place in the western section of the island, which is simply where most of the people are and where people are going into the water swimming and surfing. We can also add in here freshwater runoff from humans on that west coast. As Reunion became more and more urbanized, these coastal cities and towns would have got bigger and bigger, which means that freshwater runoff from the land would have been entering the sea and creating the perfect habitat 
for juvenile bull sharks. We know that bull sharks tend to give birth to their young in estuarine habitats. So fresh water that's running off from these urban areas into salt water creates somewhat of an estuarine habitat. And that's where juvenile bull sharks can thrive until they start getting a little bit bigger and venture out to different waters around the island. Many people blamed and still blame the creation of a marine protected area on the western coast of Reunion Island for the spate of attacks they had. The MPA was created in 2007, so you can see why when the shark crisis started four years later, fingers were pointed. But a scientific study done slap bang in the middle of the shark crisis revealed that the MPA wasn't attracting bull sharks at all. They found that half the sharks they tagged weren't even being detected by the acoustic arrays that were placed along the western coast of Reunion. And of the 18 sharks that were detected by the arrays, the majority of them spent more time outside the MPA than inside it. If the MPA was to blame, you'd expect the bull sharks to be using it significantly more than they were, but they just weren't. The authors of that study do say it's impossible to know whether the MPA had an impact when it was first created because they didn't do the tagging study back in 2007. But at least during the shark crisis in 2013, most of the sharks weren't even noticing the MPA. Right, one of the major final factors that we have to discuss here though is seasonality. At certain times of the year, it's clear there are more fatal shark attacks. Between the months of April and September is statistically the most dangerous time to be in the water. And this time of year is considered to be the austral winter for Reunion Island. During the austral winter, swell height is higher than at other times of the year, creating incredibly turbulent water, but also at the same time, creating optimum wave conditions for surfing. So you've got turbid water, great waves, of course, loads of surfers and bodyboarders in the water. What else gets thrown into the mix? Bull shark mating season. Bull sharks breed between the months of June and September on Reunion Island. And during this mating season, male testosterone levels go up and so does their aggression. This mating behavior has been observed on the northwestern section of the island near a place called saint gilles le bain an area that also just so happens to be the highest for attack rates across the entire island. So you've got aggressive mating bull sharks, really turbid murky water, and then a high density of surfers and bodyboarders in the water. That, my friends, is a recipe for shark attacks. The real question now for those who live on Reunion or those who are planning on visiting, is it safe to go back in the water? And based on the current data, it looks like it just might be. Reunion Island hasn't had a single shark attack since 2019. That's four years ago. Considering the amount they had between 2011 and 2019 was 24, I'd say those numbers are pretty convincing. The shark crisis, as it was called, looks to be over, and now it's more about mitigating the risk than anything else. With the scientific papers that flooded out of reunion in 2019, 2020, and 2021, we now have a ton of data to inform policy decisions. We know the areas where attacks more commonly took place. We also have information about the seasonality of the sharks. We even know information about the time of day, with 70% of the attacks taking place after midday. So those in reunion now who do choose to enter the sea can inform their decisions with real data. Swimming and surfing in many parts of the island is still banned as of making this video now in 2023. And I know of no plans to overturn that ban. As for Reunion Island's mitigation strategies, because they implemented so many during the shark crisis, it's impossible to know which was the one that worked. And it's likely they all mixed together to create some kind of working solution. So there we go, guys. Those are my thoughts on Reunion Island. Admittedly, I don't have any plans to go there pretty soon, but telling the truth, I'd love to go. I'd like to pass on my condolences if there's anyone watching from Reunion right now who lost friends or family during the shark crisis. And for those of you who have never been, would you ever visit Reunion Island? Has the shark crisis been solved? Let me know in the comments. But before you all dash off, because I know you like to click off right now, you're gonna wanna stick around and check out this video right here. Do you remember those great white sharks that suddenly disappeared from South Africa because of those killer whales? Well, some shark scientists have only gone and found out where they went and you're not gonna believe it. So check it out here.